Welcome everybody. My name is uh, Dean Taylor, a senior policy analyst with Plugin America. Welcome to our webinar. Uh, we have an hour and a half. We have a lineup of really great speakers. I'm going to kind of, um, this is the first of six webinars we're doing this week. And the steering committee, as you see from this slide, was Drive Electric Minnesota, Plugin America, Excel Energy, and Sustainable Growth Council. Next slide, please. This is a Zoom meeting. It's a little different than a Zoom webinar. If you have any questions, type it into the chat and we'll be paying attention to that. Everybody will be muted uh, and have your videos turned off. And we'll also be posting uh, the presentations and recordings that uh, will be available on the Plug in America website. And I believe also um, Drive Electric Minnesota is posting them on their, on their YouTube channel as well. So this is the, like I said, the first of six. Later on today, we're gonna have a, a 101 on uh, EVs in Minnesota. We'll have experts like Yuka uh, Kukunen and uh, Lisa Thurston with Twin Cities, uh, Clean Cities Coalition and American Lung Coalition. We'll have Kevin Swain from Excel Energy. Uh, and then shortly after that, later on today, we'll have a, a virtual test drive and we have a you know, like 100 people signed up for both. It's not too late to sign up if you'd like today on those. And then uh, we'll take a, a break uh, for a day and then back on Thursday with two more webinars. One is how Minnesota can lead on transportation electrification next year. That This one is particularly focused on legislation, regulation, executive orders. We're very honored to have three members of the Minnesota legislature uh, as, our, as a guest, as well as Commissioner uh, Bishop uh, will be on this one. And we have other presenters who will go into like low cost and no cost legislation, uh, a deep dive into uh, the clean fuels policy by um, Great Plains Institute, an effort that they're working on, um, and several other very interesting uh, speakers. Then we have a, a, an hour and a half later in the day on economic development opportunities for Minnesota. We're honored to have uh, two executives from Minnesota agencies on, on that, as well as perspectives from uh, the greater Minnesota area on job opportunities. We'll have a Bloomberg Noon Energy Finance speaker giving the bigger picture, uh, as well as uh, presentations more from a disadvantaged racial justice uh, perspective. I'll have a breakout session on that one. Uh, obviously it's not too late to sign up for that. And then lastly, we'll have a deep dive uh, more for the business community on uh, opportunities uh, for, for policy changes, best practices in, in all kinds of uh, business applications, be it fleets, workplace, public charging, multi-unit dwellings. And that's a, a, a lot of excellent speakers. I won't go into all of the detail. Go to the next slide. We're... Um, very excited about our uh, sponsors, uh, co-sponsors. Uh, we have uh, almost all the major utilities in Minnesota sponsoring. We have a lot of the environmental groups like American Line Association, Sierra Club, uh, Union of Concerned Scientists, Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy. We have the uh, major agencies in the state helping us, uh, including Department of Commerce and um, Met Council and others. We have a lot of um, NGOs like the Coalition for Clean Transportation, the Alliance for Transportation Electrification, Great Plains Institute. Uh, next slide. We also have uh, like Zeph Energy and Conexus Energy, um, Green Lots, uh, as far as some of the business uh, community. Uh, I'd be remiss in not mentioning Fresh Energy is, a, is another major uh, co-sponsor that has uh, helped us and gotten the word out. I think together we, between these six webinars, we have over 900 people signed up. So that's very exciting. And I hope you can join us for some of the other upcoming webinars. Um, you can uh, probably Google us really quickly and, and go to the driveelectric.org has a, has a place to sign up as well as on Plug in America Fresh Energy also has a landing page that will take you to the registration. Next slide, please. And just a little bit about Plug in America, we're the voice of the EV uh, consumer, both in Minnesota and nationwide. We're a nonprofit founded about 12 years ago. 
and our, our thousands of drivers represent some of the world's deepest pool of experience with electric vehicles. And our two core areas are policy and advocacy, which is really the focus of these, but also we, we are, are known for our education and outreach, both our PlugStar, which works with dealers, consumers, utilities. Uh, we have excellent uh, websites, for example, on shopping for electric cars. And then we're the co one of the co-founders of National Drive Electric Week and Drive Electric Earth Day. Next slide, please. So I'll start with uh, introducing our speakers. We have uh, our Honorable Charlie Zelli, who's chair of Met Council, Brian Ross, senior program director for Great Plains Institute, Diane McEwen, who's the director of a Metro Clean Energy Resource Team or Metro CERT, and Catherine Stankin, who is uh, the policy director at, at Plug in America. Next slide, please. I've um, been doing this myself for over 30 years uh, with a large utility in Southern California and I'm now an independent consultant and senior policy advisor for Plug in America. Charlie has been the, the uh, chair of Met Council since uh, 2010 and has over 30 years experience in uh, transportation policy economic development. Uh, Brian Ross is the Senior Program Director at Great Plains Institute and has 25 years experience working with a variety of partners on climate, energy policy, planning, policy, regulation. Diana McCune is the uh, lead of Metro CERT and she has led, the, uh, led that for, for many years. And we're excited to have her and, as, and is responsible for getting many of you here as has done an awesome job. She's also involved with uh, Powering Head with vehicle electrification and is an EV owner. And uh, I, Catherine has, uh, prior to working in, for Plug in America, worked in the Solar Industries Association as government affairs. And like I said, these will be recorded so you can go see the bios and other details uh, as we, as uh, we, afterwards. The agenda for today starts uh, with, um, Charlie Zelli giving our kind of intro talk, and then we'll do deep dives on EV readiness with Brian Ross, followed by Diana McCune, and then model policies that uh, cities can and counties can adopt by Catherine. Then we'll have Q&A for, so hold your Q&A till then, or put put it in the chat in the meantime. We'll, we'll do a breakout sessions. We'll, we'll come to that in a bit on what are our questions for you in the breakout sessions, and then have a recap of that afterwards. Thank you. Go ahead, Charlie. Thank you, Dean. And um, what an honor it is uh, to be with, uh, A, this panel, and then all of you for this uh, intimate conversation about electrification of transportation. I, um, I should say as a caveat, and it is probably my fault uh, as a typo, I have actually been chair of Met Council since this January, so it's 2020, not 2010, and I'm gonna get a lot of emails from people unless I say that. Um, but. Um, but I'm, I'm no stranger to the issue, having been commissioner and, and actually a EV driver myself over the past seven years. So when it gets down to that test drive or those personal, uh, you know, declarations, uh, you know, count me in. Um, but I do want to talk about the opportunity I had and, and frankly, just to state uh, that uh, this is a great time for, uh, for, for uh, the idea of EVs becoming uh, more widely adopted. And I want to just kind of set that up and then talk a little bit about it from a Met Council uh, perspective, particularly as we talk about local local governments. Um, you know, I expect President Biden and the and future administration is really supportive of climate and um, politically, nationally, um, I think we're in a really good place. But Closer to home, I can actually attest as part of the Waltz administration uh, that uh, climate and the idea of uh, a strategy of electrification of the transportation sector is uh, fully embraced. And that can really be seen as the activity of the sub-cabinet on climate, um, both the sub-cabinet that I sit on, but also uh, the uh, really the advisory group, which is multi-sector which had its first meeting yesterday, um, are really full on, on board uh, on the issue. The other thing is, you know, announced just uh, a couple of days ago, Representative Long is chairing the 
Climate and Energy Committee. And uh, spoiler alert, it turns out there's a little bit of a surplus uh, that's going to be announced uh, for the remaining uh, fiscal biennium. Uh, and so, uh, you know, there is maybe uh, some opportunities uh, for for the year ahead in terms of of policy, uh, but you'll hear more about that in in the series uh, series ahead. Um, I do think kind of focusing not just on government but the private sector. I mean, who would have thought that um, today you go to the General Motors uh, splash page on their website and there's a picture of Mary Barra, the CEO, declaring her commitment to zero emissions and introducing the whole line of future electric vehicles. I mean, I don't think we would have even seen that last year. And now with GM's announcement that they are adopting uh, California's uh, CAFE standards, not fighting uh, uh, that, uh, it really shows uh, how much we've shifted even in, a, even in a couple of years. So maybe the next slide, I can talk a little bit about uh, Met Council, its commitment to sustainability. Um, you know, Governor Dayton really put together a council that made the uh, sustainability and climate part of its whole planning function. You know, Met Council does do community development wide uh, planning for uh, all the communities within seven counties, but also we operate, uh, you know, a transit system. We also operate wastewater system. We're a big user of energy. In fact, we use as much as a mil 11 million gallons of petroleum fuel. And we're one of um, uh, a great honor. We're one of the top 10 customers for Excel Energy, just in terms of the amount of electricity we use. So when you think about our commitment to become carbon free by 2040, it's not just uh, how we work with electrification, but also how we think about planning and how we help promote uh, more renewable uh, sources, even of electricity. Uh, but speaking of Excel, the next slide, uh, you can uh, 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 see uh, that uh, the, uh, all vehicles that are electric aren't necessarily smaller cars. Uh, we really are advancing the idea of electrifying our fleet of 800 buses. Um, and you start really with uh, uh, some of the buses we have in place, but we're are gonna be able to jumpstart it with uh, what Excel is, uh, uh, advocating before the PUC, the authority to invest 100 million, 65 at least, would be dedicated to metro transit um, uh, buses. And what's important to note is that it isn't just about buying vehicles. This is going to be the incremental cost of uh, electrifying, uh, uh, you know, new bus uh, uh, operations, which involves more than just buses. This is uh, uh, the charging stations, the charging software, the protocols. So this partnership with Excel is really important because we learn as we go and, and, and we know that this is a complicated system. It's not just a, a few vehicles. It's how we develop these incredibly uh, high voltage, fast charging uh, systems to work well and to, and to work uh, responsibly. Uh, we're able to um, actually find ways to save uh, costs when we're smart about just the, how we do our charging. Uh, next slide. We think uh, about uh, Met Council's role in planning, and this really gets down to the whole local government uh, uh, interests. These nine regional ambitions, you know, you look at the bottom there, the new climate economy, transportation mobility, and then uh, the idea of, um, of having uh, inclusive growth. You know, we're baking uh, climate into this comprehensive planning process. We're just finishing a 10 year uh, comprehensive planning uh, program with uh, all 189 uh, city plans. Uh, so far 167 uh, are in place. We're now starting our next round for the next 10 year plans. But already uh, we're seeing a tremendous interest uh, in uh, environmental initiatives at the local level. And, and that's where Met Council provides not just uh, planning oversight, but support, research, um, and then of course, uh, in key areas, some uh, resources. Um, the next slide. Uh, okay, so 
Dean didn't show enough logos, so we'll show even more. But to show that we're actually not doing this alone, when we think about su providing support for uh, local governments, um, uh, it really is, again, uh, a partnership, a series of multi-sector partners. Uh, and, uh, you know, in every respect, we, saw, we found a great uh, deal of interest from, uh, from local cities who are now being asked by their constituents, what is their sustainability plan uh, and uh, you'll see on the next slide uh, you know statewide uh, just the green step program uh, these are uh, this list keeps growing and I think this is again not just a metro this is a statewide uh, interest of, of people who are recognizing uh, this is the Minnesota we love uh, and we have to protect it and um, uh, next slide I want to really talk about uh, more specifically about uh, our commitment to uh, electric vehicles. You know, we've done a number of different initiatives beyond just the planning function and our Met Transit electrification um, with uh, thank you Great Plains Institute, Brian, but uh, we've got a report uh, that actually ties solar power to electrical uh, vehicle charging. And why do we look at that? Well, one of the reasons is uh, Met Council has a lot of broad parking lots. Think about all the park and rides that are around the Metro Transit system. And if we can actually kind of link charging and using solar to help uh, uh, charge idle uh, 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 vehicles, uh, we think that's a great strategy. Also, uh, our Transportation Advisory Board, which is part of Met Council, it's the channel of federal funds coming to this region. And just recently kind of opened it up to consider uh, other kind of creative uh, uh, ways that some of those funding could be deployed, including uh, EV uh, charging as a possibility in future regional solicitations. So stay tuned uh, to that. And then also we can't understate the value again of the uh, governor's commitment to climate change and as it's being played out in the sub cabinet, you'll be hearing from Laura Bishop and others uh, but I have to say at the staff level, there's multiple agencies that are working on some of the technical uh, aspects of helping to accelerate the adoption of uh, electric vehicles. And they are very committed and very knowledgeable staffs that are working together. And I think it's a real hallmark uh, to this administration that this isn't siloed into individual agencies, but they come together and look at, uh, at, uh, at uh, ways to be effective. And, and I, I have to actually do a shout out to uh, the Department of Transportation, uh, my former uh, agency where I worked. Uh, uh, we started the uh, CAVEX uh, department, that's the connected and automated vehicle. Well, you know, one thing I've learned is uh, if it's an AV, it's a more likely to be an EV. And we are thinking about the future of automation. It really gets to uh, the future of how we uh, do everything from uh, the technology to efficiency of uh, of the of mit congestion mitigation uh, to um, actual uh, road funding in terms of uh, 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 and the vehicles are are undoubtedly going to be uh, electric. So uh, next slide, we get into the future of transit, and one of the things I get questions uh, like more and more is, is transit dead when you think about the pandemic? And uh, and actually, I think it's very much alive. And one of the things we're finding is this arterial bus rapid transit. This is the enhanced transit that goes on city streets, gets traffic light preemption. But uh, these are great vehicles. And guess what? They're electric. The C line, which runs from Brooklyn Park north down to Minneapolis, uh, has been uh, channeling the, the electric uh, uh, and we've been learning from it uh, along the way. Uh, and we actually see more and more, as many as 10 to 12 of these. Most recently, the legislature uh, gave bonding authority for the uh, B line and the D line, which is Lake Street in Chicago. Uh, these, uh, I doubt, and, and now maybe even the gold line that's coming in, uh, hopefully these become electric uh, corridors, which has great benefits for not just the climate, but for uh, air and for the quietness along a corridor and for the, um, and for the customer experience. Uh, next slide. 
Uh, so looking forward, uh, you know, climate is one of the four core strategies of the agency. And uh, we think about the planning efforts underway to actually make these strategies uh, happen. Uh, we think there's a long-term uh, uh, return on investment. So uh, we're sitting a good place. And I think this seminar really sets us up uh, to a great uh, 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 opportunity to advance uh, the conversation and get to implementation. So I'll sit back and listen to the really smart panel and uh, I appreciate being, being part of it. Thanks. Thanks so much. Our, our next speaker is Brian Ross with uh, Great Plains Institute. Um, Brian, we're running a little bit behind, so I know we, maybe you can do it a little bit quicker than 15 minutes. Thank you. Okay, well, well, I'll rush through these slides then and, uh, and, and people will just have to ask questions when I miss stuff. Okay, go to the next slide. And really what I'm talking about here uh, is, is, is specifically the kind of actions that cities and counties can, can make to tra help with market transformation efforts. And we have a new program we're getting ready to launch uh, or, or to pilot, I should say, uh, around that. But just a word about the Great Plains Institute. Uh, GPI is, uh, about, uh, is 20 years old. We have a, a mission to transform the energy system to benefit economy and environment. We have several different subject areas that we work in, uh, including energy efficiency, decarbonization of electric, uh, electricity production, uh, but also uh, electrifying the economy and adopting zero and low carbon fuels, such as the transportation work we're talking about now. Um, so go to the next slide. Um, one of the, the kind of first questions, I always want to start with my conclusions. Why do we care about EV ready communities? Why is this important? And, and Charlie really set this up very well. Um, uh, where we need to, we have aggressive goals in Minnesota and the nation uh, in terms of kind of getting to an EV future and a, and a decarbonizing electrification of the transportation sector. And in that process and in those goals, local governments are an essential partner in creating this self-sustaining self marketplace. Um, and I'm gonna focus primarily, there's a lot of different ways that local governments can work on, and our, our EV Ready program looks at a lot of those, but I'm gonna focus on one in particular, and that is the kind of development of infrastructure, charging infrastructure, that needs to happen in order to support a, a deep uh, EV market uh, um, at some point in the hopefully near future. Because EV market transformation really requires that public and private development accommodate charging infrastructure, and local governments can shape that development, and they have the tools to do so already in their tool portfolio. And really, it's just a matter of understanding how it applies to EVs, and, and we want to talk a little bit about that today. Can okay, you go to the next slide? Uh, some of the kind of myths of... of uh, uh, or I should say barriers to EV adoption, uh, and this is kind of right from the Drive Electric Minnesota, are that, uh, that, that people have this perception about EVs not being cost efficient or being, uh, not really being even uh, uh, environmentally efficient, or coal cars, mm -hmm. that they're small and boring, they don't allow people freedom, so there's this kind of mythology that, that we have that prevents people from adopting. Uh, go to the next slide. And that comes into play when we really look at kind of the market transformation barriers uh, and the targets that we want to uh, address in such programs to, to kind of make EV adoption at, uh, happen. Um, and the things that are kind of implied by that previous slide include uh, high upfront costs, um, or, or actually I like to say a lack of attention to life cycle costs uh, rather than just focusing on upfront costs. Uh, the kind of actual or perceived vehicle range, because obviously a lot of vehicles actually have good range, but people don't always perceive it that way, but also a perceived or actual lack of charging infrastructure. People say, well, I can charge at home, but where else can I charge? I don't see them like a gas station. Or people who don't live in a single family home say, I can't buy an EV because I can't plug it in at home because I, don't, I live in an apartment building. So really kind of how do we get to that charging infrastructure piece uh, in a way that's meaningful and what role do go local governments play? Okay, go to the next slide. Uh, one of the things that has been done, it was done back in 2017, but this is actually a really great tool, it's very valid, is that the National Renewable Energy Lab did a national study on, in, on infrastructure. Uh, uh, planning uh, and, and data geeks like me really love this kind of stuff, right? 
Now, who could not read a, a, a study titled National Plug-in Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Analysis? Boy, that really, it's, a, it's really something to get excited about. Um, but nevertheless, there, there's some really good uh, work that was done out of that to kind of help communities understand what level of infrastructure needs to happen in their, in their community. And you can see here on, this, on, the, on the right side, uh, left side of this page is the EV, uh, the EVI light tool that they have on their website where you can actually go on and, and kind of do an assessment for your metropolitan area that, uh, or, uh, in, in, in your state or for the state as a whole about what kind of infrastructure is actually needed. And, and this is some example of that, of that calculation up here and some of the inputs that go into it. But really, it, it's, a, it's a stunning amount of infrastructure that needs to go into place. And what this study is really looking at is not the, is not the infrastructure that needs to happen in the home, but rather what kind of infrastructure is needed to support the marketplace for public and workplace charging, the kind of non-residential charging, and it's really a, a, and and all that which includes the DC fast charging, but the bulk of it is other kinds of charging. If we go to the next slide, because we actually did this for the for the metropolitan area, uh, the Minneapolis-St. Paul metro area, and ran ran through this and said if if te if we want to get to a 10% market share. For EVs, we need to see 9,000 workplace or level two or pu public level two chargers in place in order to support that kind of a market. And that's just again the workplace or public chargers, not the not the residential chargers. But if we say that, but that's assuming that everybody has access to home charging. If we say that 25% of the population or of EV owners can't charge their vehicle at home, of which I'm one of those people living in an apartment building. Um, uh, the need for non-home level charges goes from 9,000 for the metro area up to 19,000. And then that's also just a 10% a market penetration. If we said a 20% market penetration, we're now looking at something like 35,000 public and level two chargers that need to be in place in order to support this, this level of uh, 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 um, uh, market adaptation or adoption. And currently, we have about 500. So we have to go from 500 to 35,000 in order to achieve the 20% goal that Minnesota has set. Okay, go to the next slide. Um, that same analysis that was done for the metro area on the EV light tool that's on the, 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 uh, the website at NREL, or uh, actually at, um, if, you, if you Google uh, e EVI light, uh, it'll take you to the website. Um, we can do this for multiple different metro areas in Minnesota, and you can see that the same analysis that said 35,000 for the large metro area, Minneapolis-St. Paul area, uh, for Duluth, you need 2,100 chargers to get to a 20% goal. In Fargo, you need 2,500 public or, or um, workplace chargers, uh, et cetera, across these different metro areas, and, and these are really big steps up. Um, for these areas in order to kind of make sure that this happens and we can support this infrastructure. So what role do the cities play in this? Okay, go to the next, next um, slide. We, we actually developed what an EV ready community is. Uh, and, and this has been on the Drive Electric website for some time now, and we're structuring a whole program around this. And there's kind of five principles or five categories of action, including if you want to be EV ready in your community, if your city or county, you need to have plans and policies that support EV readiness in, in, in several different ways. You need to have ordinances, zoning and other kinds of ordinances that enable public and private sector EV use. You need to, in your administrative processes, enable for the installation of, of infrastructure in a way that, that um, is transparent and predictable. You need to do market, local market transformation pro programs to address those barriers that we were talking about earlier, perceptual barriers as well as actual barriers uh, to make sure that people feel comfortable buying EVs. And you need to make public sector investments by, as a community in your own fleets, in your own infrastructure in order to demonstrate this work. Okay, go to the next slide. Those five principles are then kind of, we have shifted into action categories for our EV ready pilot program that we're developing. And that is the five action categories are, of course, policy, regulation, administration, public programs, and leadership. So I'll just give you a, a quick demonstration of what this looks like. Go to the next slide. Oh, I'm sorry. And I forgot the equity piece are, is integrated into all that. Yeah, that, that's, that's one of those things that we made sure that we have to address because there are some serious equity issues about how we develop this market and roll it out. Okay, now go to the next slide. 
this is kind of our, our draft uh, uh, program that we're coming up with. You can see the kind of action categories across the top, and then some of the different kind of best practice areas that are down below each one. And this is structured after the, it, you know, you, it's similar to the Green Step Cities program or to the Soul Smart program, the National Solar Ready Certification program <laughs> that we're actually working with on this. Uh, and you can see a number of different kinds of actions that, that are about how what cities can do in order to uh, really kind of put infrastructure in place and overcome market barriers. And we want to use this as a certification process for communities. If you go to the next slide, uh, just as an example of that, and go to the, yeah, go to the next slide, is I'm going to look at that electrify public fleets. Um, that's, that's a very simple, that's a best practice, but what does that mean in practice? And the way we'd structure the program is that, that that one action may have three different components. First, you need to complete an assessment of EV conversion opportunities, you know, the kind of fleet karma analysis or several other companies that will do that, uh, that assess what is your opportunity. You need to set adoption goals for your public fleet with timelines. So you say, we're going to actually do this, or we're going to budget for it in this manner. And then you actually have to start purchasing EVs. Uh, for fleet use. That's kind of the normal process. And what this EV action plan that we're coming up with, this um, uh, a certification process, will kind of lay out some of these steps for communities so they know how to get through and do these different actions. Okay, go to the next slide. And really, um, th th there's kind of four different kinds of actions in terms of what people can do uh, that we talk about at local government level. There's encouragement, which includes things like uh, educational materials on life cycle costs or publicly recognizing car dealerships that, that stock and promote EVs in order as a promotion way, promotional effort to get the, that the cities can do to get their dealers that are in the, in the region to actually stock and, and promote this stuff. Okay, uh, click the next one. For incentives, local governments can actually put incentives in place that include things like uh, off, uh, requiring um, EV uh, charging infrastructure as an optional amenity within things like public uh, planned unit developments or other flexible zoning, or participating in a bulk buy, or working with your municipal utility. Um, the regulatory steps that cities can take are doing things like requiring EV-ready parking within your parking standards, or sometimes even requiring actual installation uh, within things like your flexible zoning standards, um, and, and doing simple things like allowing EVs to count as toward parking minimums. It's a, kind of a little nuance, but it's very important to make sure this all works. And finally, of course, the public demonstration of of your uh, of your EVs through through things like public plates, installing public chargers at public areas like city hall and community centers, uh, and considering how to do public charging, EV charging in the public right away. This is a big challenge, but it's something that we need to get to, particularly for people who don't have places to charge at their home. Okay, go to the next slide. Uh, and we have two specific tools that we've already developed to help that. And I'll just, this is, this is I won't go into these, but we have developed, with the help of the Met Council, um, a, a set of comprehensive plan best practices for local EV action, where we looked at all the comp plans in the metro area with the Met Council to identify what policies have been adopted, and we've kind of categorized them into best practices. And we also included some greater Minnesota cities in here. Go to the next slide. And then we did a similar analysis, but nationally around zoning practices for what cities can do to, for, for best practice on electric vehicle ordinances. And we broke those into a series of best practices as well. Uh, and so these are on our website and we want to use these in our program as we move forward. Okay, next slide. And that's the end of my presentation and hopefully I got kept it under 15 minutes there. You did. Thank you very much, Brian. Okay. And I would encourage uh, people to want to a deeper dive. Join us on uh, Friday. There'll be uh, Excel Energy has quite a bit of programs that will help reduce some of the costs for some of these actions, as well as another presentation by Municipal uh, Utilities Association. Um, our next speaker, as, as I mentioned earlier, is Diana McCune. And go ahead, Diana. Great, thank you. Oh, sorry, I advanced it too much. So, um, good morning. I'm happy to be here to talk about City Action, and a bunch of the work that I've been doing over the last several years. Just a quick overview, and I'll keep it short. I know we're already behind time. I uh, just want to talk about who search is, talk about kind of the growing interest in EVs, what is cities charging ahead, um, and then I'll talk about some resources. 
So CERTS, um, some of you on the, the call are familiar with CERTS, Clean Energy Resource Teams. We are a statewide partnership with a shared mission to really work with individuals and communities to help get community-based clean energy projects accomplished. Um, and we connect them to resources, whether it's another community or technical resources or help organizing and getting started. We do a lot of work with cities and counties, um, really um, helping connect. We do a lot of our work recently with some peer um, cohorts, and that's a much of what I'll be talking about today, um, but trying to guide and give support um, to advance those goals that the local governments have. And so, uh, Charlie mentioned the Green Set Cities. Um, I'm going to bring this up now, and I'll touch on it again later. We have 141 participants, including four tribal nations statewide. Um, and this program was, you'll, I'll hear, you'll hear about um, some, some of the basis of some of the work that we've done, because there are best practices for Minnesota cities and tribal nations, including ones related to electric vehicle adoption and acceleration. So growing interest in EVs um, over the past several years, we have seen, and I just did a bulleted list of the things that we've seen. You know, we have nearly uh, 15,000 registered EVs in the state of Minnesota. We've seen increasing ride and drives by uh, community groups, cities, et cetera, until this year. <laughs> um, we always have to, you know, make the exception for 2020. Um, a lot more utilities um, doing action. We've had um, in our annual survey from Green Step Cities, uh, last year over 50 Green Step Cities said they were interested in working on uh, electric vehicles. That's quite a, quite a big number. Um, we've seen really large attendance at several EV-related webinars, including today. Um, and then, of course, we had talked about and heard about the comprehensive plan. Brian talked about it. Um, and just a list of, you know, the cities that we saw that were putting goals related to electric vehicles in their comp plans. I think it's really important to to recognize that is a growing interest um, for cities as, and for whatever reasons, whatever their goals are, whether it's economic, um, reducing, you know, uh, greenhouse gases, et cetera. Um, there are a number of reasons to, to do that, to be a leader in their community. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about cities charging ahead. Um, this was a, a peer cohort that we convened in 2018 with 28 cities across the state of Minnesota that wanted to work together to explore electric vehicle readiness. Um, we were hoping maybe four or six cities would kind of come along with our reindeer games um, to work together. And um, lo and behold, 28 cities um, came together. It was led um, by CERTS, uh, Clean Energy Resource Teams, and the Great Plains Institute. So I um, direct the metro region of CERTS, and I'm based at the Great Plains Institute. Um, we based it on the Green Step Cities program because there were already some electric vehicle related best practices. We didn't need to go out and create something new necessarily. We had done some tweaking and looking at those, um, but we had the basis of that. Um, we convened from 2018 in the spring to the uh, summer of 2019, and um, we were funded by a number of different sources, including um, also XL Energy that um, hopped in um, when we um, got more cities than we, we knew we could, what we could do with. So um, we're really grateful for their support. Um, so as I said, you know, we use the um, best practices related to EVs from Green Step, and I put the um, blog in here. There is actually um, down below here, there's a, you can navigate um, to the best practice page and filter by a number of different topics, including electric vehicles, and that will bring up all the best practices. We also have a document here on the side um, that we've put together that has all the electric vehicle related best practices from Green Step City. So, cities that um, want to explore that um, can do that, and certainly um, feel free to reach out to me. So um, just to give a sense of the, the participants, um, they were from all over the state, and once all the cities said, yeah, we're in, um, we decided to kind of put them in regional cohorts because I felt, we felt that it was really important to be able to meet in person, build those relationships, share that information, and that became a really important part of this work, you know, working together, hearing how they were overcoming barriers in their community, what they were doing. The popcorn updates at the beginning of the meeting became a, the meat of the, the meeting, um, them sharing with each other, just providing a forum for that to happen. So um, it was really great. We have very active um, cohorts. This picture is actually the one in Northeast um, Minnesota. <coughs> 
And excitingly, we had, you know, an, we, we did ask each of the cities to identify which of those green subsidies best practices they wanted to work on at the very beginning of cities um, charging ahead. And we had a total of 51 that were accomplished, um, you know, and 16 of those cities are completing them during that period. I think a number of cities joined to just learn more for the future. Some were ready to act, some weren't. Um, and then, you know, kudos to the um, cities that uh, accomplished the most. And you can see below the most popular ones, not surprising, charging stations, fleets, and then certainly um, comp planning. Um, so after the success of that, um, we actually launched earlier this year a similar peer cohort related um, called PAVE, Powering Ahead with Vehicle Electrification, focused specifically on municipal utilities, so kind of just making a slight pivot to municipal utilities. Um, I'm not going to talk about that much, but then we did um, get funding from McKnight for a second round of Cities Charging Ahead 2.0. Um, we didn't call the first one 1.0, but now we're referring back to it. I'm calling it 1.0 to make it clear. Um, so we did have, um, we have 29 participants, um, 28 cities in one tribal nation. 14 cities are returning from CCA kind of 1.0. Um, so, it, you know, that makes, makes us feel pretty good that they found value because they came back for more. Um, we do, um, we've done, we did a charging um, uh, set of meetings um, this fall in September. And we're going to do some meetings around fleets and talking about fleets and fleet analysis. And then um, in January and then in February, we're going to be talking about those EV standards and EV ready cities, which um, my colleague Brian just mentioned. So if there are cities out there that are not part of this, you can still reach out to me. You can still, we can, we can get you in. We can, we can get you to participate. Um, and so here's, a, you know, I thought I'd just throw up, uh, again, um, cities all over the state, mostly the metro, but all over the state, cities that are really interested in, in talking about how they can take action um, to accelerate adoption of electric vehicles in their community. Um, and so we did, this information um, is from some surveys, um, post-survey from Cities Charging Ahead, pre-survey from 2.0, um, and, you know, we see that you know, and this is imperfect, it's a survey. Um, there's been some staff changes and things, but we've, we've seen over 30 <laughs> EVs added to fleets during the last couple of years. I'm here, you know, just thought it would be interesting to share kind of what are the common vehicles, probably no big surprises there, but exciting to, to see action, at, you know, not just learning, but taking action, which is, you know, what CERTS really tries to do is get people to action. And then for EV charges as well, over 40 EV charges, and this is probably an underestimate um, and then just a couple of bullets about, you know, where they often at the city hall, at, I think where they start or a community center, they're mostly level two. Um, and, you know, one big question we get all the time, cities want to know what other cities are doing, especially are you charging for electricity or not, you know, kind of all of those questions. And so that, that peer work really makes a difference. So then lastly, you know, we did create a number of um, resources for cities and counties to use as they go through the um, process. Um, so coming out of the um, cities charging ahead and we put all of those resources on the Drive Electric Minnesota site, that made most sense. So uh, Great Plains Institute does um, facilitate um, the Drive Electric Minnesota partnership. So we created a tab, communities, char communities charging ahead. We want it to be broader than cities. Certainly a lot of the resources we have could be used by counties or even businesses or nonprofits if they're thinking about adding um, a charger or they want to look at an electric vehicle. So um, you can go to the Drive Electric site and on the communities tab, we have a couple of different um, uh, in the drop down menu, you can look at the work that Brian talked about becoming EV ready some history about cities charging ahead and some of that work. Um, we have um, EV charging guidance, including a brand new guide to purchasing an EV charging station, and then some other resources. And I'll go quickly through these. So in the categories for the resources, you know, we've broken it down into kind of educating, I should say, yourself and your community, engaging your audience, promotional tools, and then taking action. So a number of different um, Products that we have, you know, some materials, a slide deck, et cetera, um, to really give you the tools that you need. Um, this top 10 facts is really about the truth, really busting some of those myths, especially in Minnesota, cold, snow, 
other pieces, other, other information. So it really helps kind of you have the information about um, what, the, what the truth is about electric vehicles and addressing some of those myths. Um, we have content sharing kits, um, you know, templates that you can tweak, samples for your website, all kinds of different um, things that you can use. Like I said, the slide deck, we have over 100 slides with information. You can pick and choose, again, to educate yourself, your staff, your community um, on a number of different topics. We also have some fast facts, EV quizzes, some social media posts, and then the Bride and Drive Toolkit, which is amazing. Um, the electric vehicle fast facts is just a half page, double-sided, not a lot of graphics. It's a PDF, so you can print it and, and um, get it out there. It's the thing that you want to hand out to people. Um, at a ride and drive or at an event um, that they can really understand that top head is probably more, it's a four page document more for you to answer questions and understand. Um, and then the, the EV quizzes, I love them. I think you can have a lot of fun engaging audience, you know, tweeting out a, a, a you know, question or a quiz. You can use them as a survey. You could do something fun with it with a giveaway at a ride and drive or an event. A lot of ways that you can use it. And then we have the social media guide that has posts um, and all kinds of stock photos and things that you can use. And then finally, the Ride and Drive Toolkit, which is amazing, you know, all kinds of, everything you need to, to, to create a Ride and Drive. They will be back in 2021, and I know that we're going to see later today a, um, a virtual one, um, but when we get back to doing it in person, um, and then there's my favorite hashtag, butts and seats, because we know that's the best way to get people to purchase EVs is for them to drive them. And then lastly, to take action, um, you know, pick a best practice from Green Set Cities and, and go ahead and act. Um, also, just want to mention, I talked about utility programs growing. Um, more and more, we're seeing utilities putting out incentives and programs. So really, look to your utility for, uh, for assistance and helping you with your work. Um, I did want to mention there are two, it's unusual to have funding for charging out there, and we have two rare opportunities right now, the Volkswagen Settlement Funds for Level 2 Chargers. The applications are due February 8th, so you still have plenty of time, and currently there's a MnDOT um, funding for clean transportation, and the LOI is due next Monday on the 7th, so look into those if you're interested in some funding for charging. Um, and then just a couple of testimonials from the folks that we worked with in Cities Charging Ahead really found it useful. Um, so if you're a city out there and you want to get involved and be part of the fleet sessions or the EV Ready uh, community sessions um, in early 2021, let me know. Thank you so much. Thank you, Diana. That was great. I wish we could have done this at a brewery or something in person, but uh, and done some of your quizzes. Um, Maybe next time we'll, when we do this, we'll have, have more fun like that. Um, our next speaker is Catherine Stankin with Plug in America. We'll be talking about a model policy toolkit uh, for cities. Great. Well, thanks, everybody. And thanks for joining today. Dean, can you hear me OK? Uh-huh. OK, great. And I apologize to everybody. I don't know what this uh, little yellow picture is here on the slides, but that's driving me crazy. I want to stop sharing my screens and get rid of that. So it must have been like a, a marker or something. So I apologize for that. Um, but so Plug in America, we, um, Dean already introduced us uh, briefly in the beginning and we're the voice of the EV consumer. And so we represent the drivers of electric vehicles in Minnesota and nationwide. And what I just wanted to briefly talk through today was our Achieve Transition to EVs Model Policy Toolkit. I think that um, Brian and Diana and Charlie, they did a great job already of letting you know of so many resources that you have available to you in Minnesota. Um, so I'm not sure I'm gonna say anything additional that they already didn't say, but within this toolkit, I think you'll find some of the exact ordinances that you can then copy and use for your own community on um, the exact language there. And that was the intent behind us making this toolkit because why recreate the wheel, right? There's already been um, tons of exact language created by other cities and communities around our country. So this toolkit is, um, is for you to use and then to be able to copy and implement those policies in your own city or your community. So we have different categories of policies as well within this toolkit. We have things that will help you to enable the vehicle purchase, to increase charging infrastructure, prioritize equity and expand access, and then also to electrify the fleets. So I'm just going to highlight a few of these policies that are relevant for cities and local governments. So here they are. There's about 14 different things that we mentioned in the toolkit. And um, for example, number six there and seven, uh, um, Diana, she just mentioned those using the VW settlement funds. And Brian talked a lot about the EV ready wiring codes and ordinances. And 
Diana mentioned the ride and drive events. And so I'll highlight just a couple of the ones that um, we didn't discuss already. So first off, the street light and power pole charging access. This is something that your city or your local government can do. Um, and for example, this is well implemented in Seattle and in Los Angeles. Um, also um, across the pond in London, they're doing, and in Europe, a lot of cities are utilizing the electric capacity as a part of a street light um, when it's not in use during the day or there's just excess capacity there to do low level charging. So I would encourage you in the toolkit to take a deeper look into Los Angeles. Um, this might also be something that's very helpful for the rural communities. Um, there's tons of street lights everywhere. I mean, that exists, that electric infrastructure already exists. So there's a great, that's a great way to capitalize off of it and then to, um, you know, better utilize that investment in the street lights. Another example here that I want to point out too is about um, how cities and local governments can partner with dealers to sell EVs. I think it's no surprise that this is still kind of a remaining barrier to greater EV adoption is how can we get the, the dealers a little bit more excited and help them to sell cars? This is a new product that they're not used to selling. And so um, Plug in America, we offer one solution here. It's called Plug Star. And we will train up the dealers in your community and we'll partner with um, sometimes with a city or with a whole state or with a utility, um, however that partnership comes about. But we'll train up your dealers and then um, tell them how to sell the cars and uh, inform your consumers then about um, you know, lead them to these trained dealers so that they're having a, a good buying experience, a good purchase experience there. And we can also connect then the dealership with the local utility to then complete that circuit and make sure that then the customer is getting on the right charging rate. And then um, another example there is Madison Gas and Electric. They partnered with their local dealers and you can read about it there, but they did a great um, kind of a promotion scheme that whoever, whichever dealership in their local community was selling the most EVs, they won a social media campaign um, worth about, uh, I think it was about $1,500. So that's a really creative, unique um, way to just grow the partnerships within the community there and help educate the dealers. Another interesting program here is for the zero and low interest loans. This is something that we started in Washington state, actually, it's called EVs for Everyone. And it was a partnership between us and then a local um, credit union. And that credit union is very interested in electric vehicles. And so they're, um, they offer low interest loans as low as 3.24% and then also 3.49%, depending on if it's a new EV or a used EV. So developing that partnership with your credit unions, that might be another way to, um, to grow that EV adoption. And then this right of way charging, this is something that uh, I think it was Brian mentioned in some of the tools and um, the analyses that he was going through. Um, but I would just point out that Sacramento is doing a lot of good things with their programs and then also New Orleans. And then I put a picture here, a little screenshot of a report that NYSERDA did, which I thought was very comprehensive. Um, they detail how you can go about with the site selection and they did this report for New York City. So if you could find sidewalk space in New York City, you can find it in all of your communities, I think too. And finally here, just a note about workplace charging. Um, this is, so I'm, I'm sure many of you are familiar that, you know, if you're not charging at home necessarily, your greatest other place that you're going to be charging is at your workplace. And so we're big proponents of helping um, cities and local governments enact workplace charging programs and develop, developing those partnerships between the workplaces and, um, and you all, the local government leaders, city leaders. So, and I love this picture here in the, that shows that, you know, offering free charging to your employees or even, you know, a place to charge, that's an employee benefit that is super cheap compared to things like, um, you know, a gym membership. And even though maybe we're not all in the office these days, um, that's still a good way to, you know, attract and, and attain talent um, eventually when we're all someday back in person and at the workplace. Other ways that you can get involved um, as a city and local government, um, Diana mentioned a lot of things about ride and drive and, and Brian mentioned some things too. Um, about local proclamations and whatnot. And so if you wanted to tie that all back to National Drive Electric Week or Drive Electric Earth Day, these are big nationwide celebrations of the electric car. And so you can see, um, we just celebrated it this past September. I kept a list of all of the um, online activities that we had this past year. So depending on April, if we're still doing things um, virtually, you know, this might be a great way for you to get the word out about EVs to your community. Um, and so there's the two websites there, driveelectricweek.org and driveelectricearthday.org. Um, I encourage you to take a look and then maybe register an event and then we, we can help you plan it and organize and get EVs out to your events. And I will sum up, um, 
with that and then turn it back to Dean and we are going to launch into some breakout sessions. Actually, we have some time now for to oh, open up for Q and A. Catherine, were you going to unmute people to do that? I think if they just want to type a question in the chat, that would be preferred at the moment. So right now, the main question we've had so far from uh, the chat is on uh, the need for EVs to pay their fair share for. Uh, maintaining the roads. And there's been a fairly lively discussion. Plug in America has an upcoming webinar on this that you can register and go into that. Uh, and another commenter was mentioning how um, even the gas tax doesn't pay enough for the road expenses. Uh, does anybody else on the panel wanna address this question about um, road fees? And, and Minnesota does have fees on EVs to deal with some of this. Brian, Charlie, uh, Diana, you want to address? You know, I might just uh, uh, mention uh, when it comes to the trunk highway fund, uh, you're right, fuel taxes is uh, less than half. And the other part is uh, uh, motor vehicle sales tax and registration fees. So if you take the uh, cost of an EV, which, uh, uh, you know, I always used to compare the Chevy Cruze to a Chevy Volt. Well, now it's Bolt but they're actually a little bit more expensive because of the charging infrastructure. There's actually more road fees coming from an EV, even without the $75 registration fee, just because it's a higher value car and it's already contributing to road uses. So fuel tax is actually less than half of what goes into the trunk highway fund, just pointing out. And there's another comment here from Drive Electric Minnesota that they did an analysis on this topic and EVs are already paying more than their fair share with the, with right. the existing fees. Another question uh, to the group is, uh, was um, any suggestion to encourage existing businesses with parking lots to consider level two stations? Any of our panelists want to address that? Uh, well, this is Brian Ross. Um, I'll, I'll just, uh, the, the, the question about existing parking lots and transforming them is always one of the, the difficult uh, things to get to uh, because obviously you're 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 retrofitting a parking lot that wasn't necessarily designed for charging infrastructure and the costs are 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 higher but um, I, I um, but they're but they're not outrageous <laughs> and to the extent that uh, as has been pointed out by by several people on the call on, on the on the panel. Um, Actually, providing uh, electric charging as a workplace amenity for your employees is is a is a great retention strategy for employees and attraction, uh, and something that eventually um, businesses are probably going to need to do. Uh, there's also um, a, a, a a real um, kind of a payback uh, potentially to certain kinds of businesses that have retail customers, uh, and that by by putting charging in. Uh, you actually attract more business and retain a little bit more business because people will stay while they charge their vehicle. Uh, but the, the kind of critical point of this is, is to make sure that we don't end up in the future with the same problem. So that every new parking lot that goes in place <clears throat> needs to, the city should be requiring that it has EV ready um, uh, infrastructure built into it because putting it in at the time of construction or major renovation um, is, is, far cheaper and very easy, and you can actually put in place uh, infrastructure for uh, a high percent, fairly high percentage uh, of, of your spots to be EV ready. You know, I mean, when I say high, I mean maybe up to 10%. We've actually seen some cities that are requiring up to 20% uh, of new lots to be that way. So there's kind of this question of existing lots versus what we do in the future to, to make sure our, our parking structures are future-proof. I also would add that I encourage you to, to go to our Friday uh, webinar. Um, Excel Energy is off as well as some of the municipal utilities will be presenting on incentives to help businesses with uh, putting in charging. There's also a question from the group about uh, encouraging uh, car rentals to, to be EVs. Uh, and there's also another, um, yeah, does anyone wanna take that question really quickly? Here's another question about 
identifying what companies would be good targets for workplace charging? Anybody have an idea identifying which ones should be targeted? Well, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, Catherine, I talk, why don't you go ahead? Well, I would, I would say there about the, um, with the rentals, I mean, that's the, the point about the rentals is to get people to feel familiar with EVs. And I think um, with the ride sharing companies, the transportation network companies, what Uber and Lyft have committed to recently, I think that's going to help people a lot. I mean, every time, you know, that they're riding in one of those cars, that's not going to be electric by 2030. I mean, that's going to give those riders um, greater confidence in the cars too. And then understanding the experience of charging that the Uber and Lyft drivers and other TNC companies that they're going through in terms of the charging. I mean, I think that will speak uh, volumes to how easy it'll be to charge and just, you know, understanding their experience that they're driving all the time. And so if they're, you know, driving 200 miles in a day for, for the, you know, to, for the rides and someone who's just a passenger is understanding like, well, I'm only going to be driving 30 miles a day to get back and forth to work. It's going to be no problem. So I, I kind of see that that's a good avenue to merge into the car rental area to then kind of increase and grow adoption and, and consumer awareness. Um, could somebody post uh, yeah. really quickly the, the link for the Friday webinar? We're also getting, we're gonna have to jump here to the breakout sessions here really quickly. Um, but there's a bunch of other additional questions here such as uh, sites for DC fast charging. Uh, what are the relative costs of charging stations? Can EVs be really one-to-one -one replacements? And maybe I'll take that one-to-one -one replacements question. Uh, remember, there are plug-in hybrids. About half the market out there are don't have range limitations because they can drive like 400 miles total with you know anywhere from 20 to 50 miles uh, per charge uh, electric. And then a lot of the new EVs are in the two to 300 mile range you know category. And then as far as like Somebody's asking about life cycle costs. Uh, if you took away all the incentives, um, I don't think we're there yet. Uh, maybe in some cases, but uh, the price of uh, electricity is really cheap and the maintenance is low. So for example, in many parts of Minnesota, you're paying 50 cents to a dollar gallon equivalent if you're charging at home. Uh, you know, away from home charging is, is more expensive because of these additional costs. Dean, let me just, just uh, add on that um, the EVs competing. Depends on the mileage you do. If you drive a lot of miles, the EV is absolutely cost effective without incentives um, yeah, because it's a per mile cost is lower. Yeah, and, and, and I'll just note that, that the analysis, the Consumer Reports recently did an analysis, of course, around uh, life, life, life cycle costs. And one of the things that people think about, they, they don't think about is that was mentioned by Dean, uh, is that the O&M reduction cost are kind of a, operations and maintenance that you have to do on an EV is so much lower. It's actually, uh, in many cases, a bigger savings than the fuel cost savings. So uh, that's something that people don't think about. They think it's a small cost. It's actually a very, it's actually a big chunk of the savings. There's also, maybe we'll go jump here after this to the breakout sessions, but uh, there's a question about e-bikes and that's not outside the group. Uh, we just don't have a particular uh, focus on but there's everything from electric motorcycles, neighborhood electric vehicles, electric scooters, e-bikes. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, different options out there that are very um, effective and important part of uh, the overall solution. Um, and really quick, on the battery cost longevity, I would encourage you to come to our session, our next session here on EV 101, where we're gonna get into the, a lot of the additional um, stuff, because uh, we're getting a lot of questions on just EV basics here. I'm going to go close to being all back. Maybe we could uh, go through. Charlie, did you are you back? Did you want to give a quick summary of uh, your breakout room? Uh, sure, I'll be really quick. We had a great conversation. A number of uh, uh, sharing of uh, expertise on charging, uh, particularly charging stations. <laughs> One of the issues, and I think important, is that when we think about public investments, really it's the private in-home uh, charging that is probably the best opportunity. And how do we have local ordinances support uh, having uh, new construction uh, uh, kind of charging ready? And also, uh, particularly in Bloomington as an example, the older buildings, how do you develop incentives for those that are kind of missing out? And that's an equity issue. How do you offer 
incentives and a balance to ensure that uh, older buildings, older residences have, have this opportunity if in fact electrification is the future. Uh, we have a number of comments with two more, but I think the role of utilities uh, is really clear and it's great to have a utility in the, in the room to kind of talk about programs that are being supportive. I'll go next, our breakout session. Um, several people wanted to see Brian's presentation to have the more detailed links. There was particular interest uh, from uh, Marshall City in getting into the details of uh, ordinances, uh, you know, to, to actually start implementing something there. We had a, a discussion regarding the need for more education. Um, and we did have a utility in our, in our group as well. Um, and there's just a lot of things you can do there for like including low cost things to just recognizing, you know, individuals and businesses in your city uh, doing micro grants. Um, city of St. Paul mentioned the Our Car project as well. Uh, Matthias, how about your um, breakout session? Um, I think just to echo some of what others had said, um, but just, first, first of all, everyone that presented today, fantastic job, I think. Um, one person even mentioned that they were on a, 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 a solar uh, a solar webinar a couple weeks ago and that this was just so much more informative. So um, th thanks again to all the presenters for that. I think our, our group was suggesting that there's um, positive momentum in the state, including the Twin Cities Metro, but um, lots of work going on in rural areas as well um, in, in greater Minnesota. Several mentioned that they've been working to bring um, EVs and EV charging into the, the municipal comp plans. That said, we, we were talking about barriers, um, particularly in this upcoming year, um, budgets are tight. I think we all are aware of that. And so possible solutions there, I think is going to be important. The other area, um, again, focusing on the greater state of Minnesota, but this is an issue in the Metro as well. EV availability at some dealerships. If you're in southwestern or, or northwestern Minnesota, you need to get to Fargo or Sioux Falls to, to get you to, to even try to drive an EV. And um, if we're going to encourage more adoption, we need to see um, more EVs and more dealerships across the state. Thank you. Amy, how about your breakout session? I think we should. I think I'll hop. Yeah, I'll hop in. I sort of jumped in and took a picture. We were both in the same group. So um, great conversation. We had a couple of cities and a couple of municipal utilities. So it was a nice mix. Um, a really important question that was brought up is I have limited time. Where should I spend my limited time? And it always goes back to the goals. You know, is your goal for your community to save money? Is it to reduce greenhouse gases? What, you know, and when you think about the biggest impact, it's it's those ordinances and, um, you know, that private development. That's the biggest, um, I use the wrong um, cliche, but uh, arrow in your quiver, you know, is that's the biggest impact you can have. Um, and then, uh, you know, some other, you know, needing some cost arguments or cost um, justifications for city council. Certainly with fleets, um, the total cost of ownership is cheaper, and that's an economic argument. So, you know, really just kind of looking at that. And then, you know, the municipal utilities talking about how they could help get some of those ordinance ideas out to their cities. So planning on working with a bunch of them already are. Um, so great conversation. Great. Uh, Brian, how about your breakout session? You're on mute. Thank how about you. now? Yes, go ahead. Okay, uh, the uh, we uh, we had we had several people who have, were having audio problems, so we had a lot of listeners. <laughs> but um, the uh, we did have actually two utilities in the room, um, that, that both of which are serving uh, you know uh, uh, rural Minnesota or greater Minnesota, uh, and and they had some very interesting kind of uh, concerns and questions uh, about how to do this at scale in terms of, of, of demand on the utility systems, as well as kind of how they implement their programs uh, that they already have for encouraging um, uh, EV, uh, EV development, uh, charging, uh, charging program or providing of charging programs, uh, and the dilemma of transforming existing parking areas to become EV parking areas. That is, a, that is a, something that's come up a number of times. Uh, you know, we kind of know how to do it, for new development, we have tools to do that. To get to existing development, it gets very expensive. 
And, and when you get into greater Minnesota, it's not like they have a lot of development happening that you can kind of just let the normal, you know, build out process have an opportunity to, um, uh, to get to uh, uh, EV charging infrastructures. You need to figure out a way to get to existing buildings and the utilities are obviously a primary way to do that. But kind of working in conjunction with the cities is something that we were, we were talking about. Um, and then there were some specific problems that people came up with about how uh, um, the, the, the dilemma of, of just getting to that EV ready, um, I'm sorry, that EV uh, available uh, in their particular workplaces and the like. And Peter, how about your um, breakout session? We had a pretty uh, diverse range of uh, participants in our breakout session. Uh, we had a very interesting uh, mention of a all electric car sharing fleet coming next year to Minneapolis, St. Paul, and possibly expanding to some of the uh, other, not only the suburbs, but also some um, exurbs or, or more rural areas and the needs for that car sharing fleet. Uh, discussion about that. A, lot, a couple of people were just, you know, interested uh, participants looking to learn more and are appreciative of what we're talking about and, and hearing more about this. We had um, from Public Works Division of, I'm blanking on the name of the city, I'm sorry to get that, uh, but talking about city fleets. And then we had a consultant who was actually working with Iowa, an Iowa city, on their vehicle fleets and noting um, they don't have a whole lot of mileage on their typical city fleet vehicles. What they did was they shared the fleets between different agencies in order to get more utilization out of those EVs and uh, thereby improve the economics. That was a pretty interesting uh, recommendation. So with a lot of perspectives from the car sharing to the, the fleet operations to just interested participants. Um, so we're starting to, to run over a minute. Caitlin, you wanna take maybe 30 seconds on your group and then we'll probably end. Sure, um, so we had a pretty small group, I think. The, the main highlights that I took away from it are, you know, there's still just some questions out there regarding how much to charge, if anything, for charging. Um, and then also where to service electric vehicles, particularly in rural areas that don't always have those um, certified dealerships set up. Um, so those are definitely some topics that Drive Electric Minnesota will be focusing on in the near future, um, maybe highlighting some things in blog posts. Great, so again, we'll be posting all of these. Uh, send us emails if you wanna see individual uh, presentations or 